There is a truth older than the ages. There is a promise of things yet to come. And there is one born for our salvation. Jesus, Jesus, there is a light that overwhelms the darkness. There is a kingdom that forever reigns. And there is freedom from the chains that bind us. Jesus, Jesus, who walks on the waters, who speaks to the sea, who stands in the fire beside me. He rose like a lion, he bled as the lamb, he carries my healing in his hands. Jesus, there is a name I call in times of trouble, there is a song that comforts in the night. There is a voice that calms the storm that rages. Jesus, Jesus, who walks on the waters, who speaks to the sea, who stands in the fire beside me. Trust 
Everybody. Welcome to our church family and friends who are joining us yet again online. It's uh, fantastic to have the ability to be able to do this. Hey, I want to remind you, um, we've been announcing for the last couple of weeks, it's on our website, uh, that we're going to be doing a selfish potluck next Sunday. So that's August the 9th. Um, if you don't know what that's all about, basically a potluck is where we would typically share food with one another and lay it out buffet style, but we're calling it a selfish potluck because we want you to bring just food for yourself. Don't bring any food to share, just bring your own food, your own drinks, your own chairs. We'll set up in the parking lot, we can set up on the grass areas here at the, the building. 
Um, and we'll have the physical distancing and such, but you know, go to McDonald's before coming over, make up a picnic lunch, whatever it is. And it's an opportunity to see some folks that we haven't seen maybe for some time. So I hope that you're able to make it for that. That's next Sunday, August the 9th. Now that day is also going to mark the, the beginning of our voting on our new name, which is Refinery Church. And that's what we're voting on. So if you're a member of the church, I'm gonna encourage you to go to our website. You can find all the details on the voting there and how we're laying it out and such. But that's gonna start on August the 9th where we'll have live voting here at the building for those who are able to come to the building on that day. So please check out the details on the website. We're gonna be voting. It'll be open from August the 9th to August the 23rd. And again, the details are all on the website. So I'm gonna encourage you to go there and I hope that you'll be able to get out and vote on our new name. All right, enough uh, of the infomercials. I want to get into this here today because I'm, I'm very excited about the message for today. Um, for the last four weeks, I, I, I feel like I've basically been saying the same thing over and over and over again, that, that adults generally do not become Christians because they get all of their questions answered or they get all of the obstacles to Christianity removed that they might have. Um, because they figure out everything that is needed to be figured out or because they work through all of the issues that they might have. Generally speaking, adults become Christians when, when something comes along that, that shrinks the questions or, or shrinks those obstacles. And that's what we've been talking about for the last three weeks. I hope you've been able to, to join us for that. And if you haven't, you can go back on our website and watch those ones. But if you weren't here, we started off on week one of this series talking about why men don't want to get married. Some of you will remember that. And we had a little bit of fun with that. Um, you know, guys, generally, we don't want to give up our freedom or we're scared of commitment or I don't have enough money to go ahead and, and, and get married or... Um, you know what, I look at other married couples that I know and I'm not really sure that that's what I want to get into or, or maybe I'm too young or what if I meet the right person right after I married who I thought was the right person or that kind of thing. And, and we said that guys actually go ahead and get married anyhow, not because all of those issues are resolved, not because they get answers to all of the questions that lie in front of them. They get married because they fall in love, <laughs> because it becomes intensely personal and it's no longer just this category of marriage, but it becomes very personal. And some of those questions and issues, they're still there, but in the face of love and it becoming very personal, those things, they shrink, they become a whole lot smaller. And then we went through um, our lists and you know, maybe you have your own list of, of issues that you have with Christianity or, or issues that you have with God. And for some of you, it's the Bible. For some of you, it's, it's suffering in the world. And, and you know, can miracles really happen? Is that like a legitimate kind of deal? Or what about all the other religions that are out there? And maybe your family of origin, maybe you grew up in a family where it's like, you know, they weren't open and the, the whole God thing was just not a part of it. And you don't want to say, yes to God now, be, be sort of the odd man out or the odd woman out on that. Um, maybe it's other Christians that you know or, or just life experience or an experience with a church where you got burned somewhere along the way. So we talked about all of the issues that, that our list of issues of, you know, these are the things that become obstacles between us and Jesus Christ. And then last week we talked about the unexplainable and the undeniable. That was kind of fun too, if you were able to catch that. Um, I told you a story about a blind man who received his sight from Jesus. And then we talked about the fact that there's a whole lot of things in life that are unexplainable, but there are a lot of things that are undeniable. And we talked about how in life we, we always opt for the undeniable over the unexplainable. Um, for example, I mean, we use things like technology all the time. Um, and it undeniably works. I mean, this microphone that I'm using, the camera equipment and such, and the audio, how it all works, and, and the technology that you use and I use, I don't understand it all. It's something that I can't explain, but it's undeniable. It works, right? And so we've got these things in life in the same way then that adults become Christians, not because they're able to explain everything. It's just that there are certain things that are undeniable. So that was all last week. And so my hope over these last few weeks, the last three weeks, has been that you have been able to see that you don't have to have all your questions answered in order to embrace Jesus as your Savior. 
And, and listen, your questions are important. Right through this series, we've said that. Your questions are important, and, and in no way would I want to discount your questions or the obstacles that you have. But there is a way for you to be able to bring those questions and for you to be able to bring those obstacles that you have towards faith in Jesus Christ, and you can bring them with you into a relationship with God. That's generally how adults become Christians. Or sorry, that's generally not how adults become Christians, I'm sorry. Instead, what usually happens is something takes place that, that it makes Christianity so intensely, so very, very personal. And it shrinks all of those obstacles, and it sort of shrinks all of those questions. That's where we've been for the last three weeks. Now, today as I close out this series... What I want to do is, I, I know you've got your questions, and I know you have your obstacles, but what I want to do today is talk to you about a couple of questions, two questions that you really need to wrestle with, two questions that all of us really at some point need to wrestle with, and if you're not in a relationship with Jesus Christ, these are the two questions that you really, really need to, you know, wrestle to the ground. And, and if God and Christianity and the church have been issues that you have, you, you have questions about, and listen, your questions, all of whatever questions you have, they basically center on these two questions that I want to talk about today. That's what about, that's question number one, what about, and question number two is why would? What about and why would? Like, like what about this when it comes to Jesus? And what about this I read in the Bible? And what about this that's happening in the world? And what about this that happens in my life? What about, what about, and why would? I mean, why would God say that? Why would God do this? Why would this happen if God is a good God, right? Most all of your questions are going to center on these two questions. What about and why would? And listen, we could sit down and we could have a Coke or a coffee or whatever and we could talk about these things and, and you could bring your questions and, and you know, we could sit at the table and, and banter about your questions. And I, listen, quite honestly, I wouldn't be able to answer all of your questions. Um, and the fact is, is that maybe nobody would be able to answer all of the questions that you have. And, and even if I could, or even if somebody could, or I could give you a book that's going to help you, uh, you know, walk through the questions that you might have or provide some answers, receiving answers to all of your questions, it doesn't bring you any closer to God. And so here's what I want to do today. I, I want to just give you two questions that, that I really hope that you would be able to wrestle, re wrestle with and sort of really wrestle down to the ground. All of the questions that you have can be put under these two questions. And, and the questions that you have, they're, 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 they're important. Again, I'm not ignoring them. But, but uh, those categories and stuff, if you even get answers to all of them, it's not going to bring you any closer to God. But if you ever decide that you are going to choose to embrace or, or that you want to move towards Christianity or move towards Jesus Christ, I hope that you would be able to take your obstacles. I hope that you would be able to take the questions that you have and just set them aside for just a moment. Just put them on the table for just a moment and wrestle with just these two questions. Who is and what happened? Who is and what happened? If you are ever going to get to the place where you would embrace Jesus as your personal savior, and again, there's this personal aspect to a relationship with God, it's going to happen around those two questions. Not all of the other questions that you might have, but around those two questions of who is and what happened. Your questions are important, but your questions might put you in a death loop for the rest of your life because some of them, quite frankly, they don't have answers. We don't have answers to all of your questions. But if you wrestle these two questions down, you're going to move closer to God. Here's why. <clears throat> because when you ask the question, what happened? The reason that question is so important is because unlike other religions or unlike other ideologies or unlike other philosophies, Christianity is not grounded in a thinking. Christianity is not grounded in a philosophy. The thing that is a foundational and is the foundational truth for Christianity is something that happened in history. It's an event that actually took place in history. Actual events that got the whole Christianity deal rolling. <clears throat> We're going to take a look at one of those in just a few moments here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's the what happened question, and that's why it's so important. And then the reason that the who is important is so, in, a question is so important, is that that's the question that really trumps all the other questions. 
all of the questions that you might have, and maybe you've got a whole list, a page long, all of the questions that you might have are trumped by this one question, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Because that's pretty much the deal. At the end of the day, that's the question that you really need to wrestle down to the ground is, who is this Jesus character? <laughs> who is Jesus? And what happened 2,000 years ago? Because those two questions are the foundational questions when it comes to Christianity. And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff. Again, you've got your questions, but these two questions are foundational to your relationship or your potential relationship with Jesus Christ. I guess my point is really simple here. If you ever decide to choose Christianity, if you ever decide to follow Jesus Christ, and I hope and pray that you would, or if something happens where maybe you are going to consider God again because you had at one point and you walked away and maybe if something ever happens where you're going to consider God again, maybe for the first time, maybe again, instead of getting all caught up in, in all of the questions and all of the mysterious sorts of things that might be fi fun to talk about, right? They might be kind of interesting to engage in and, and talk about, but it sort of leads you nowhere, my hope is that you would come back to these two questions that we're talking about here today. Because these are the questions that make it personal. Today I want to tell you a story from the New Testament of the Bible, second half of the Bible. And it's one that maybe you've heard of before, maybe you've kind of um, heard referenced before, but don't really know the full story. It's found in the Bible book of Acts. So if you want to, you can turn there now in your Bible, or if you've got the Bible app, the U version, you can open that up to chapters. We're going to look at chapter 7 through 9 here today, kind of move through a few chapters today. In this story, we're introduced to a guy, a guy who asks this question, who is? That's the question that he asks is, who is? And in this case, who is Jesus? And he was constantly answering the question, what happened? <laughs> What happened? For us, it's 2,000 years ago. For him, it was what happened just, just a short time ago. <laughs> this story actually takes place, um, it's months and months and months after Jesus was crucified. Um, after Jesus was crucified, the, the Romans and the Jewish people who were a part of putting him to death or a part of that crucifixion, they thought it was all over and done with. They thought the whole Jesus thing was, was, was finished, right? Um, the wannabe Messiah was now dead. Uh, things could get back to normal for those who wanted to live in that Jewish community of faith and, and for those who wanted to live in a Roman environment of peace, which is what Rome wanted in their territories. But instead of getting back to normal, all these Jewish people in Jerusalem, there were a whole bunch of them that kept talking about Jesus. <laughs> And, and you jump to a few weeks after his resurrection, there was just this huge explosion of interest in Jesus and thousands and thousands and thousands of Jewish people in Jerusalem, they started to believe that Jesus was their Messiah, the Savior that they had been waiting for for hundreds of years. And the reason that they believed this was because hundreds of people were going around Jerusalem and they were saying, we saw Jesus. And they were like, well, yeah, we all saw him. And then he got crucified. And they were like, no, 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 we saw him alive. We saw him crucified on that cross that day. And three days later, we saw him alive. And there's hundreds of people who had that experience, who saw Jesus alive. And they started spreading the word all through Jerusalem. And as a result, thousands and thousands of people in the city of Jerusalem were coming to faith in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> this was all very unsettling to the people who had killed Jesus, to the Roman authorities and to the Jewish authorities who wanted him dead and gone because he was kind of upsetting their apple cart and, and affecting uh, sort of their, their faith the way they understood it. They sort of thought, listen, if we kill the guy, we're going to kill the movement, right? That was kind of their thinking. And Except now, the movement was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It was gaining steam. It was taken off like crazy in Jerusalem. And it was disturbing to these folks. It was disturbing to the Rome, Romans. It was disturbing to the Jewish religious authorities. And so they decided, we, we need to find a way to put an end to all of this. I mean, and, and the one thing you need to know is at that time, these people weren't called Christians. The people who were coming to faith in Jesus, they weren't called Christians. This was just an extension of everything that these Jewish people believed. 
So they had their belief system, and Jesus came along, and it was really an extension of everything that they had believed, and it really it, it, it summarized it. It brought it to a, 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 a pinnacle, if you will. One of the most effective speakers in that day about Jesus, one of these guys who obviously had seen Jesus alive and came to faith in him in those early days after the resurrection, was a guy by the name of Stephen. And Stephen was just this incredibly effective speaker about the message of Jesus Christ and what the people had seen and what they were now placing their faith in, which was a man who died and came back to life, right? And the more Stephen spoke, the more people in Jerusalem came to faith in Jesus. So he would go talking and these people would say, I, I, I'm, I'm on board, I'm in, count me in. And, and of course the Jewish uh, religious authorities didn't like that. And so they're kind of focusing in on Stephen. They couldn't shut this guy down. And so they hired some guys, they paid them off to lie about Stephen. And then they arrested him based on these lies. I'm, I'm kind of condensing this into the, the Cole's Notes version or Cliff's Notes for our friends in the States. But they arrested Stephen, they tried him, they convicted of him, him of something that was worthy of death, and then they stoned him, which was a modern day way of, or a, a modern in that day. It was, in that day, that was a way that they killed people. They would stone them with large stones. The, the, the point of stoning actually was that the entire community would gather around and take part. Um, it was a way of saying no one person put this man, Stephen, to death. The entire community felt like he needed to die for whatever it was that they had falsely convicted him. They stoned Stephen to death. He became the first Christian martyr, which means that he was simply killed for his faith in Jesus Christ. Now, during this stoning, there were people who were divided over this whole deal, right? They were divided over, is Jesus the Messiah? Is he not the Messiah? I mean, these guys saw him alive, and they're like, thousands of people are, are claiming to now, you know, believe in Jesus. They're putting their faith, their trust, their confidence in him, and it's like, where do we fall on this, right? It's maybe where you've been at yourself, maybe where our world is at in a lot of ways. But there was a division between the people. Is, is he the Messiah? Is he not the Messiah? There was a really smart young man who was present uh, on that day when Stephen was stoned, when he was put to death. And here's the scene. If you can picture it, maybe it's like, I sort of think of it like a Hollywood movie. There's this huge pile of coats, these dusty coats that, that the guys who were going to do the stoning, they'd taken their, their cloaks off, their outer garment, they'd taken it off and they'd laid it down because, you know, they're going to pick up these large boulders and really give it to Stephen here. And so they piled up all these coats and, and, and standing by the coat, sort of overseeing the whole thing, watching these coats and such, there's this guy there. And at this point in history, we're introduced to this guy who eventually becomes a household name, whether you're, you know, a follower of Christ or not. Buildings have been named after him. Schools and hospitals have been named after him. Educational pl places have been named after him. You have maybe been named after him. But at this point in history, he's standing there with the coats and he's overseeing the whole thing and he's watching the stoning of Stephen and he's going right on. This man deserves to die. I mean, he, we've got to shut down this. They believed it was a cult. We've got to shut down this whole cult deal that has attached itself to our Jewish faith. We've got to put an end to this whole Jesus deal. That man's name was Saul. And he would later become known um, by his Roman name, which was Paul. You've probably heard of him. Paul. He became the, the preeminent church planter. I, I know, it sounds really baffling when you think about him overseeing this stoning of Stephen for his faith. He becomes the preeminent church planter. He wrote half of the New Testament, which is the, the second half of the Bible. He wrote several of the letters and books that we have in there. This is the story of how he became known. So with all that as sort of set up, I want to read this story, and then we're going to come back to those two questions, remember? So this is Acts, right at the end of chapter 7, verse 58. Here's how it reads. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul, which is what we've just described. They put their coats down because they're the ones, the, the witnesses were the ones who were going to do the stoning. So they've laid their, feet, their, their coats down at the feet of a young man named Saul. And Saul was there giving approval to Stephen's death. And here's where the story gets interesting. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles 
were scattered throughout Judea and throughout Samaria, sort of the neighboring provinces and regions. See, what happened is when the people who didn't buy into faith in Jesus, when they started seeing, oh, so we can kill followers of Jesus? It's okay for us to put Stephen to death? It's okay for us to take out the followers of Jesus? It became open season on anyone who declared faith in Jesus Christ. And so the people who followed Jesus, these people who were now believing in Jesus, they, they, they ran. <laughs> they scattered. And so they started heading out into the regions all around Jerusalem, right? The only ones who seemed to stay in the city were the apostles, Jesus' closest friends. So we've got now all these Christians <laughs> who are scattered throughout the region. Jump to chapter 9 with me. Meanwhile, Saul, he's still being called Saul here, but Saul, Paul, it's interchangeable, okay? Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Later in Acts, we find out that Saul, Paul, had, had Christians arrested and tortured. He, he, this is the kind of guy we're talking about. He would torture them until they recanted of their faith. Paul, Saul, went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, which was north of Jerusalem, there, so that if he found anyone in Damascus who belonged to the way... And like I said, they didn't call them Christians at that time. They simply called them followers of the way. So if he found anybody up north who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So Saul is saying, okay, um, now that we've sort of laid down the law in Jerusalem, these Christians are running. They're heading to the hills. They're running out into all these regions outside of Jerusalem. He's like, I, I want to go after them. <laughs> I'm going to chase him down. We're going to put an end to this thing. This is the kind of guy we're dealing with. This is Saul. He was adamant that this whole Christian deal, this the way, was polluting the Jewish faith. They called it just Judaism. Pause here for a moment with me. Imagine that we could drop into this particular piece of history, into this particular story. And that in Jerusalem on that day, we're standing in, in the square outside of the temple and, and out comes Paul and, and he's got a stack of papers that he's just received from the high priest and, and it, it's letters, it's, it's permission slips to allow him to go get the Christians. That's what it is. It's permits, if you will, to allow him to go do this. And we're standing out there and we see Saul and we know who Saul is because we've been watching what he's been doing in Jerusalem. We, we heard about or we were eyewitnesses to, to the stoning of Stephen. We know who Saul is and now he's got these letters that are going to let him go get Christians all over the place. And if somebody were to say to us as we're standing in the, the square that day, if somebody was to say, you know, what are the odds that that guy Saul is going to become the greatest proponent of the message of Jesus Christ? Well, we'd be looking at each other and going, well, that would be less than zero, right? I mean, what are the odds that that guy who's walking out with his permission slips to go capture and imprison and torture and put to death, to death Christians, what are the odds that that guy is going to give his life to furthering the message that he's now trying to squash, that he's trying to kill? No one was more passionately opposed to Jesus Christ than Saul. No one. And yet the reason that you've heard of Paul is not because of his opposition to the church, but because he did more to spread the news of Jesus Christ than any person who lived during his time and maybe more than any person who's ever lived. So what happened? <laughs> I mean, what in the world happened to this guy? Paul, with his entourage of people, he's on his way to Damascus. He's going to round up these Christians. And, and we get to verse 3 of chapter 9. Here's how it reads. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And you know, I think Paul, Paul was this incredibly educated guy. He was really, really intelligent guy. I think if that moment was not so chaotic for him, and he would have sort of been able to sort of process and think things through a little bit, he might have said, what do you mean persecute me? <laughs> I, I'm persecuting an it, not a me. I'm persecuting a false theology here. I'm going after an idea that is all, I think it's all wrong. This isn't about a person. This is about a philosophy. This is about a theology. This is about a belief. This is about a movement. But what Saul heard was a voice that said, Saul, why do you persecute me? 
And at that moment, Saul asked the most important question that any of us could ever ask. It's one I want to challenge you to ask if you've never done before. Saul asked, who are you, Lord? Who are you? You see, the answer to that question, it trumps all of the answers to all of the other questions that you have. Who are you, Lord? Asking that question shrinks all of the other questions that you have down to a size where they're manageable and sometimes answerable. Who are you, Lord? Well, he got a response. The voice says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And once again, Paul could have said, well, whoa, 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 time out here, Jesus. I mean, I'm not persecuting Jesus. I'm persecuting a movement. I'm persecuting a belief. I'm persecuting a philosophy. I'm persecuting an ideology here. This isn't personal. (laughs) But Jesus had already made the point. His point was, oh, yes, it is, Saul. (laughs) It isn't between you and a religion. This is between you and me, Saul. Listen, you know that that internal thing that goes on inside of you, and maybe it happens when you're alone. Um, Maybe it happens when you're lying in bed looking at the ceiling. Maybe it happens when you're staring at the mirror kind of deal. But that sort of internal thing that goes on inside of you, that that thing that shuts down your Christian friend, maybe you got a Ned Flanders type who's living next door to you. I don't know. Maybe it's your boss, right? That thing inside of you that shuts down your Christian friend or, or your neighbor or the guy at work. That thing that shuts down your spouse, maybe, who's tried to talk to you about Christianity, and every time they invite you to the next event at the church or to watch something online or, or they give you something to read or they give you something to listen to and you're like, ugh, you know, and like not another. But when you're alone and you've got that solid sort of, you know, exterior going on and, and, and you're determined that no preacher's ever going to get to you or... Isn't it true that when you're alone and sometimes just thinking or, you know, looking in the mirror a little bit, isn't it true that there's an unresolved battle that goes on inside of you? Listen, here's the idea that I want you to take home today. That battle is not between you and ideas. That battle is not between you and the church. That battle is not between you and your background, your family that maybe disregarded God or church or it was never a part of things in your family. That battle is not between any of It's between you and the person of Jesus Christ because this is personal. And if you would just stop for a moment and take all of your questions and take all of your objections and just, again, set them on the table, just set them aside just for the moment here and wrestle with this one question, who are you, Lord? Perhaps that would be your invitation to your heavenly Father to do inside of you what he's already done inside of so many people who are watching right now. And that is simply to take what is maybe a category for you today, God, Christianity, and that it could become personal for you. You know, Paul tells this story later on in the book of Acts. He, he tells it right near the end of the book again. He's talking to some other folks, and he's sort of recounting his story, and he's telling it to them, and, and he gives another detail to this particular portion of the, the story. In, in Acts chapter 26, you don't need to turn there. Stay, stay where we're at here in, in chapter 9, but I'll just read this little bit to you. He says this, We all fell to the ground, as he describes, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, which was the language he would have spoke, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And then he adds this little detail. He says, It's hard for you to kick against the goads. <laughs> a goad, if you don't know. It was a long um, stick, sometimes maybe a piece of steel that people would use to, to poke animals to get them moving in whatever direction you wanted to get them moving. So you'd have this stick to poke them with, right? And, and it was useless to resist the goad. I mean, you would just keep getting goaded and go goaded and goaded and goaded until the animal finally got up and moved along, right? I mean, they're just going to, we, we use the term sometimes, so they're, they're goading you into, right? Like, that's where it comes from, is you're goading an animal until they finally move. It's useless to resist that goad. So in this moment, Saul hears Jesus say to him, Saul, 
you're, you're persecuting me, Jesus, and it's, it's, it's pointless to resist me. You can track down all of my followers. You can run all over the region here. You can track them all down. You can round them up. You can threaten them. You can imprison them. You can kill them. You can fight and fight and fight and fight, Saul. But in the end, Saul, I'm going to win. Saul, it's pointless to resist me. You know, for some of you, that's been your experience. You find yourself even having those imaginary kind of conversations with a God that you might say that you don't even believe in. (laughs) But in your heart, you're having those conversations and and you have winning arguments. (laughs) And maybe you've never stopped to say, why is it that this even bothers me? Why am I even thinking about this? (laughs) Here's what it is. It's because it's not an it. It's personal. It's not a thing. It's a person. It's personal. And that's, that's why I challenge you in those moments when you're thinking, I, you know, I, I, can't, I think I've got it all together. And, and, but then there's something inside of you that's kind of churning still. I challenge you in those moments to say, Lord, who are you? Is this a person and not a thing? story goes back to to Saul on that road to Damascus and Jesus is still speaking to him and Jesus says to him so Saul I want you to get up and go into the city of Damascus and you're going to be told there what you must do so Paul's going to Damascus we find out that everyone in Damascus knows that he's coming and that they know what he's coming for I mean word travels fast right and so they knew in Damascus Saul's on his way he's coming to round up the Christians and and it was going to be a real easy task because the Christians I don't know if they were all that smart at that point because they just kept meeting in the synagogues and so all Paul had to do was go to the synagogue and well there they all are right it's like so this was an easy chore that he had in front of him but before he gets there Jesus stops him and says I need you to now go into the city you're going to find out what to do Meanwhile, in Damascus, God has woke up this dude by the name of Ananias. And he says to Ananias, Ananias, you're going to have some company today. And Ananias says, hey, great, who's it going to be? And God says, well, it's actually Saul. And Ananias says, hmm, Saul the Christian killer? Like, uh, I don't think so. I mean, what's happening here? In fact, here's how it reads. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man. (laughs) I've heard about all the harm that he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he's coming here with authority from the chief priests. See, everybody knew what was going on. To arrest everybody who calls on your name. So, uh, like, why are you bringing him to my house? I, you know, maybe, maybe take him to the neighbors or, don't, you know, whatever. But the Lord said to Ananias, Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument. Saul is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles, non-Jewish people, and their kings, and before all the people of Israel. Which, by the way, is exactly what happened. Listen, the reason that you have heard of the Apostle Paul is because that is exactly what Jesus said was going to happen. Jesus said, Paul's going to be my advocate. He's going to do things that he said to Ananias. He'll do things that, Ananias, you can't even begin to imagine. Jesus chose the most unlikely person on the planet to carry his message. So Ananias, I mean, I'm long story short here a little bit, he brings Saul in, and Saul has been made blind from his encounter with Jesus on that road, that bright, bright light that sort of flashed and so on. He's been made blind, and, and so Ananias shows up at Saul's house, and, or <laughs> Saul shows up at Ananias' house, and he's blind, and I don't know if Ananias was like, whoa, this is an opportunity, you know, we can, we can take advantage here of this guy. I mean, give him a little what for or something, but of course he doesn't do that. Ananias goes to Saul, and he puts his hands on him. And here's how it reads, immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. And he got up and he was baptized. That's a step I'd love for some of you to take. He got up at that moment and he got baptized because he believed. And he didn't have to have all of his questions. And he didn't have to wait three more months. And he, he didn't live in fear of doing the baptism video. or what, You know, he just got up and, and was baptized. And some of you would maybe say at this point, well, hang on a second. Saul's moving way too fast here. This doesn't make any sense. I mean, Saul, don't you have a few questions that you'd like some answers to at this point? I mean, like, what about and why would, right? That's our questions. What about and why would? What about this, God? What about what's going on in our world today? And and why would God allow? And why would this happen? And I can't believe, and this happened to my sister, and that happened to my family, and it's, why would? What about? And, And now for Saul, it's like, Saul, how can you go from I'm trying to kill them to I'm one of them? 
I mean, come on. That's like, you've done it and just, you're the one who, in your mind, you've already justified why Jesus isn't the one, and you've got great arguments against him, right? Like, I mean, isn't that what it's been about for you? Don't you need to work through some of those things before you say yes, to, before you get baptized? I mean, people are going to hear about this, Saul. You're going to lose your friends back in Jerusalem, those, those religious guys who know you so well, and they think you're the greatest because you're pursuing all of these guys, these Christians and stuff. I mean, don't you need to work through some of your objections to this whole Christianity thing? To which Paul would have said, no. <laughs> no. Because those aren't the questions anymore. <laughs> all that list that I had, those aren't even the questions anymore. These are who is and what happened. And Saul would have said, let me tell you what happened. <laughs> and let me tell you now who I am convinced that Jesus is. I don't have answers to all my questions. But I'm telling you, those two things made all of my questions really small. The stuff that I thought was so big is made awful small in light of the answers to those two questions. Who is and what about? And maybe I'll get some answers to those things down the road. I don't know, but I'll tell you this, I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. Because on the road to Damascus, it became unbelievably personal. Jump down to verse 20 in chapter 9 still. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. And, and you got to know that freaked everybody out. Because when Saul was coming and he's showing up at the synagogue and you're a Christian at the synagogue, you're running. <laughs> And so the Christians were gone. The only people left in the synagogue was some of the Jewish folks who really hadn't fallen into a belief in Jesus at this point. And so they're there, and, and here comes Saul, and he starts preaching that Jesus is the Son of God. And those who heard him were astonished. They're like, what? And they started to ask themselves, well, isn't he the man who raised havoc back in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners back to Jerusalem to the chief priests? So they were just like baffled, right? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful, and he baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Son of God, is the Christ. Now eventually, those guys, they finally drive him out of Damascus. They're like, we don't know what's going on with Saul, but they drove him out of Damascus. He goes back to Jerusalem, so he's returned back to Jerusalem. And so, so now here's Saul in Jerusalem. I mean, he is all in. He's all in. He, he he believes fully in Jesus. He's been baptized now. I mean, he's got lots of questions. There's still lots of questions. So who do you think he wants to see when he gets back to Jerusalem? I mean, who's left in Jerusalem that's even a follower of Jesus Christ? Because they all ran because of Saul, right? Well, the disciples are still there. The big guys, we might call them, right? There's Peter, and there's John, and there's Andrew, and there's James, and all of Jesus' closest friends, his disciples, his closest followers, those 12 guys who did life with him for three years, they're all still there. And Saul wants to meet them. He wants to go talk to these guys. He wants to probably ask some questions, right? How bad do you think they wanted to meet Saul? <laughs> They don't know what's going on with Saul. All they know is Saul's been killing Christians, and we're not sure what's been happening in Damascus, but uh, I'm not sure that we want to engage with Saul. Here's what happens. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was really a disciple. Of course. No person can change like that, right? <laughs> so Saul, he stayed with them. Eventually, they kind of, you know, they engage a little bit, and somebody mediates a little bit, and they kind of hang out with them, and Saul stayed with them, and he moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. It's just a fascinating story, but here's the point. The real questions are not the questions that you and I would sit down over a cup of coffee and go round and round and round and round and talk about for hours and walk away, and whether there were answers or not, you'd be no closer to Jesus Christ. They might be some questions that you have that are important questions, but the real questions are not the questions that we go round and round with. Saul had those, but he came to the realization that all of those questions that he had about who Jesus was, they took a backseat to these two things. Let me tell you what happened, and let me tell you who I believe he is. And that's the same battle that goes on inside of you. What if it's not just some belief? What if it's not just some philosophy or some ideology or some cult thing or what? What if it's not? What if it is a person? What if there's a God who invites you to call him Father? And what if Jesus is his Son? <laughs> and what if his Spirit is in this world? 
And what if he loves you so much that he decided that he's not going to sit down and have a Q&A session, but instead he sent his son to be your savior. And he's not going to force you to believe. He's going to let you decide. But what if the tension inside of you is that personal? What if you begin to pray, Lord, who are you? Because if there's a Jesus to know, don't you want to know the answer to that question more than you want the answer to all of the other questions that you might have? Because can, can you see that if, if Jesus is who he says he is, then that becomes the context for discovering answers to all your other questions. And some of you are thinking, well, <laughs> you know what, if I was driving down the road going to Walmart or wherever you're going kind of thing, you know, and, and, and you know, big light hit and, and my vehicle kind of hit the curb or whatever and I got out and, you know, I was blind and a voice spoke to me, like, if what happened to Paul happened to me, hey, I'd believe too, right? If it was that sort of dramatic kind of, you would say, if God did that to me, I'd be in too. You know what, if that's your deal, then you know what, you've just admitted <laughs> that there's a way around all of your obstacles and there's a way around all of your questions that you've held up in some cases as a smokescreen to the whole Christianity thing. You see, there's a potential Damascus Road experience for all of us, for you. Something that God could do to get your attention so quickly, that potential is there for all of us, just as it was for Paul. And my question for you is, why wait? Why not say, who are you, Lord, right now? Because if there is a you to know, if there is a Jesus to know, I don't want to miss out. I don't want to miss out. Later on, Paul would write these words. Here's what he wrote. He said, one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He didn't say, someday, every question will be answered. (laughs) Every obstacle will be removed and we will have this universal, ah, oh, moment. That's not what he said. He said, you may never completely understand, but one day, the whole world, including you, will be convinced. So let me close with this challenge. Because for three weeks, I've asked you to pray, God, if you can be known, I want to know you more than I want to know the answers to all the questions that I have. Would you simply add to that, who are you, Lord? Because wrestling with that question is generally how adults come to faith in Jesus Christ. Because something happens that becomes so personal that all of the other objections, all of the other questions, they begin to shrink. So if you've never crossed the line of faith and said yes to Jesus Christ, would you at least begin to pray, who are you, Lord? I want to close by leading us in a prayer here. And if you want to take a step towards God, and I would hope that there are some of you watching right now that would, then I'm going to ask you to just pray along with me. You can pray the same words, just pray them along in your heart. But let's take this opportunity to place our faith in God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I believe that your son, Jesus, paid the price for my sin. And I want to receive that gift of Jesus Christ now. I want to place my trust in you and I want to follow you. I want to make it personal. That's our prayer, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, if you've just prayed that with me, I'm so excited to celebrate that with you. And I hope that you would talk to the person who invited you to watch or that you would send an email to our church. You can send it to scott at christschurch.com. .ca, I'll get that. We'll be able to celebrate together. I'll be able to talk to you about next steps and sort of following up. We could talk about baptism and that. Or if you've got some questions, don't hesitate to call our church or to send an email or to talk to the person who invited you to watch. We're just so glad to have you engaging with us through this means. Take care and we'll join up with you again next week.